as we turn to, in the New Testament, to Galatians chapter 4, and we'll be picking up with verse 12. And like I said last week, if a lot of this sounds similar, well, it is. It's, it's dealing with Judaizers and the law versus grace and, and those people that were coming in to divide the church and give false doctrines at all. And Paul's looking at it for so many different angles. And today he'll be looking at it as inheritors, looking at Sarah and Abram. And uh, he's been, uh, been speaking of heirs of our fathers, you know, our earthly fathers. We inherit earthly things from our earthly fathers, but when you compare that to inheriting what we inherit from our heavenly father, we inherit heavenly things, eternal things, and it's all here in the Bible. It's not like it's a great mystery anymore, but he's also warning them that they need to be careful what they, who they serve. And uh, many of the people were, were serving false gods, and the consequences of Serving a false god is very severe, and it's eternally severe. So we need to be very careful who it is that we serve, because that's who we will worship. Verse 12, Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as you are, and have not injured, and you have not injured me at all. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you at the first? And my temptation, which was in my flesh, you despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where, where is then the blessedness you spoke of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me, which indicates he had an eye problem. I am therefore become your enemy, or am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So he's, he, uh, he's saying, I'm a Jew as you are. And uh, he had put away the law. He would put it behind him as he said they should have, and they did. But he said, he's also saying, you know, I have the same temptation toward legalism as you do. And Paul is basically begging his friends, saying, please imitate me. Be free from that bondage of, of being under the law like I am. And Paul certainly had a a physical problem. He called it a thorn in the flesh. And the, I looked up the word, uh, the Greek word for thorn. It actually means a, a stake of wood, like a tent stake. Uh, the, the idea is it's a severe one. And we were pretty sure it was a problem with the eyes. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, he said, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. In other words, God showed so many things to Paul that he'd never shown to anyone before. He says, those things could have puffed me up. Because of that, he says, there was given to me a thorn or a tent stake in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. He says, just so I don't get too full of myself here. And he, he wrote in Romans 5, 3, that we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation works patience. So, glory in it. <laughs> James also wrote in James 1, 3, knowing this, that the trying of, our, of your faith works patience. So, Paul had a thorn in the flesh. It was a trial. It was trying his faith, but it was also working patience in him. And uh, there's a common uh, error within the body of Christ in churches across the world, actually, t teaching that illness is not part of God's plan for believers. If this is true, if trials and tribulations are not, not part of God's plan, then Paul didn't have enough faith. Part if we believe that as Christians we should be in perfect health, I don't know, are we? <laughs> That's not what I detect in me or anyone else here. The idea is, well, you, well, you know, you just, don't, you just don't have enough faith. And that's the, the, the name it and claim it or the faith movement or blab it and grab it, however you want to call it. But, and you, so you'd have to say that Paul, because of the things that happened to him, he must not have had enough faith because look at all the troubles he've had, he's had. And the fact is, there have been times I have prayed that people be healed, not really thinking they'd be healed, and they were healed. Other times I look at somebody who's sick and I pray for them, assure that they'd be healed, and they weren't healed. So that would tell you that God is sovereign and I'm not, okay, in case you were wondering. Uh, <laughs> but he's the one that can deliver us from sickness or from troubles, and it's based on his will, not our will. It's based on his power, not even our faith. Because the faithful can run into troubles too. So Paul is remembering his trials 
in, in the flesh. He says, he's, he says, I'm not really a great example of strength and power. Remember, he said, I speak weakly, you know, and, and uh, he has, I have this physical infirmity that bugs me all the time. Now, he blessed them greatly. But in Gal- the Galatians loved Paul, and he says, you, I know you love me. You would have even given me your own eyes to meet my needs if I, if I needed that or if that were possible. And he's saying, you know, all the things that God has shown me, I've shown to you, and they've been a blessing to you. Are, 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 am I now your enemy because I confront you with the truth? The truth is not always well received. Truth is not always well understood. My... Uh, grandson who's no longer with us anymore but we had I had built a little this is probably over 20 years ago I'd built a little tree fort more like a platform in the trees out back of our house when we lived at Fairport and I put a swing in there that you could grab the or rope you could grab the rope and swing out and and one day he grabbed the end of the rope where the knot was and he was going to watch grandpa and I said don't jump why well I said let go of the rope he let go of the rope and the knot went right down and hit the ground <laughs> So the rope was too long to swing. He would have gone right to the ground. Uh, he didn't understand at first. He was disappointed at first. When I showed him this, the rope went right down to the ground, and he'd just smack into the ground if he grabbed the end of it and jumped. He was blessed at that, and he grabbed it further up and swung out. Now, did I love him less because I confronted him with the truth? No. Paul uh, wanted them to, to have the truth, even if they didn't like it. That's the idea. We, we're purveyors of truth. Uh, in fact, Proverbs 27, 6 faithful, says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, someone who loves you enough to come to you with a truth that may hurt. Kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So truth is truth, and we should be speaking it. Verse 17 they zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you, may af- that you might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. And oftentimes, false teachers would use affection to draw them into their false doctrines. And oftentimes, we find people that are drawn into cults will report a great love and affection from the cult members and the leaders. Because, you know, even the, the heathen love one another. Love is not uh, constrained only to the Christians. Uh, but with the cult, group, cult groups, uh, oftentimes that love ends very quickly when you don't go along with the program, when you don't do the things that they that ask you to do or tell you to do, actually. You can tell if something's a, a suggestion or a command by how people respond to whether or not you respond to it. So uh, love can often turn to hostility when you don't conform to what they're trying to get you to do. And Paul's saying zeal's a good thing when it's properly directed, but it can also be used for evil. Paul said in Romans 10.2, it's possible to have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, not when you really understand God. Remember the apostle Paul's zeal before Christ. He was first zealous to do what? Destroy the church, to cause great troubles uh, to, the, to the people in the, uh, uh, who were so, uh, worshiping Christ. In fact, Remember, he held the coats of those who were stoning the first martyr, Stephen. The crowd uh, in Jesus' day was very zealous to crucify Christ. And they certainly carried out God's prophecy, but they still killed the Lord of glory. And Paul is telling the Galatian Christians, be zealous from the Lord, for the Lord, even when I'm not there. Don't, don't just wait for me to be there, to be honest. And uh, don't let your zeal for God be dependent upon others, because we all we all need a relationship with Him. Remember, God has no grandchildren; only we're only children of God. In verse 19, He goes on and says, "My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now, and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you." So he's, he's speaking in tenderness now. He's got a tender heart towards them, calls them my little children. Uh, he's talking to them as, as their spiritual father because he was the one who led them to Christ. He was the one that went through and planted the churches. He, he's concerned for their welfare. He wants to pray for them because he loves them so much. They're so dear to his heart. And he wants their faith in Christ to be deep enough 
to keep them from these false teachers and this legalism that says law plus Christ. And he's saying, you know, I don't really like to use strong words, but sometimes it's necessary. He feels they're in danger of losing the faith, their faith in accepting these false doctrines that have been around, getting caught up in the legalism. And, and he, Paul says, if you want to be under the law, you don't understand the, God's intention for the law. You say you want to follow the law. He's talking now to the Judaizers, those that came, come to faith in Christ, and says, what, we've got to keep the law, too. If you want to follow the law, do you know what that means? It means, it doesn't mean you'll have righteousness if you can keep it all, because you can't keep it all. And if, and if since you can't keep it, you can't find your righteousness in it, because since you can't keep it, Christ went to the cross for nothing. He went to the cross, he died in vain, he says. He says, don't you hear the law? The law will lead you into a yoke of bondage, and it's impossible for any man to bear he says, don't you hear the law? The law brings the curse, for it's written, and he, uh, cursed is every man, man that continues not in the whole law to do the things that are written in there, therein, Galatians 3.10. For if any man keeps the law, it violates in one point, he's guilty of all the law. That's in James chapter 2, verse 10. He's saying, don't you hear the law? Don't you hear that you can't get righteous by it? It's kind of like saying... You know, flick them in the forehead with your finger. Wake up, wake up. For it is written, verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Remember, God had promised Abram and Sarah a son. They got old. They got way, Sarah got way past the childbearing years. 90, that's a little past, right? A little past. But God said he'd give them a son, so you know, they, they're thinking, well, God's going to need some help because we're a little old for that, you know? So Abraham had Ishmael with Hagar on Sarah's suggestion, and Abram went along with it. And God later gave them Isaac. With Sarah, Sarah and uh, Abram had Isaac. So the Jewish legalists would call themselves children of Abraham so that they were blessed. And Paul agrees, yes, you are children of Abraham. You're, you're descendants of Abraham. But he's saying you're more like the descendants of Ishmael than you are of Isaac. And he asked them, if, if Abraham is your father, who's your mother? Hagar or Sarah? The one of the bondwoman or the one that God chose him? Ishmael was born of the slave, Hagar, born according to the flesh, because it was mankind, Sarah and uh, Abram, stepping in to say, God, you need help. We're going to help you. Isaac was born to the free woman, Sarah, born according to promise. Ishmael, son of the flesh, or man's solution to God's promise, or Isaac, God's promise, the son of promise. And the legalists promote a, a relationship with God based on bondage, he says, according to the flesh. The true gospel of grace offers liberty in Christ, a, a promise that's just received by faith, just by believing. God is the one who gives us a gift. Or faith is a gift from God. Our ability to believe is a gift from God. <clears throat> Amazing. Verse 24, which things are an allegory. It means they have another meaning. Uh, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which genders the bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. So in verse 27, Paul is quoting Isaiah 54.1. And he's contrasting the legalists, these Judaizers, with children of faith. He's saying, those that are gathered into heaven through faith will greatly outnumber those who try to reach God by keeping of the Mosaic law. Simple. Verse 28. 
Now, we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what says the scriptures? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall be shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. These false teachers were persecuting Paul just the same way that Ishmael mocked Isaac. And Paul's relating true, true Christians to Isaac, the child of promise. We, we identify with Isaac, the child of promise. In other words, righteousness received by faith. Uh, and he's saying that Ishmael and his descendants have been persecuting uh, Isaac, persecuted men and his descendants. And he says the, the answer to all this, cast out the bondwoman and her son. In other words, law and grace can't live together in the same house or the same body, in the same mind. Throw out the law of Moses. Throw out the legalists. Throw out those false teachers. And those legalists, those false teachers, they caused problems in the early days of the church. They still cause problems today. And we shouldn't be surprised that people who follow God in the flesh persecute those who follow him in faith. Even the religious nominal churches do this, claiming to be believers, saying they're Christians, following laws and rituals instead of the, the word of God and the, the God of the word. <clears throat> and today, one of the greatest enemies of salvation by faith alone in Christ alone are the legalistic churches that say you have to behave a certain way. You've got to dress a certain way. You've got to drive a certain car. You can't have red cars or yellow cars because it's too ostentatious and flashy. Can't dress with flashy clothes. <laughs> uh, but when you find yourself under rules and res- regulations, it's a work-centered entrance into glory with God when faith alone really is the answer. And all those who belong to Christ inherit the blessings of God. And, and once we've tasted the goodness of God and his love, we won't want to walk away from him. <laughs> There's nowhere else to go. I did a lot of searching before Christ, before 1985. Zen Buddhism and Zoroastrianism, whatever that ism was, and one after the other. I would just seek one philosophy after the other. And, no, this isn't it. This isn't it. Then it came to the Bible and Christ, and I went, this is it. I'm home. I don't need to look anymore. Once we've tasted his grace, we don't need or want legalism. And the Holy Spirit is producing his fruit in us. We don't need those external laws. The Holy Spirit draws us into the deep things of God so that we can know them and pass them on. The law says no undesirables wanted here. God's grace said there aren't any undesirables anymore. All are welcome into the body of Christ. Law or grace. Paul's trying to make it crystal clear. We're going to be under one or the other. So what's your choice? Put yourself under a yoke of bondage, as Paul says, as he was warning, or, or receive God's grace. And if we've been saved by grace, God's grace, then it's time to live it. Now, let's do a few verses here in chapter 5. We've been talking about heirs of God by faith, Abraham's spiritual descendants. Now let's talk about standing in that liberty. He says standing fast in that liberty. Fast and stand kind of sound opposite, don't they? Fast indicates running. But this means fast means fastened to. Standing fast in the liberty. Verse 1 in Galatians 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Paul's saying, you know, things are going to happen that will deprive us of that liberty that comes freely from Christ. And the gospel calls us into liberty. But however we choose to behave, we must be willing to accept the responsibility of our actions, live with the consequences. And who would, I mean, who would want to take that liberty away? A little Satan would want to take it away. Sin can take it away. Companions that we decide to, to hook up with or be friends with, pleasure can take it away. All are deceive, deceivers, and deceivers corrupt the, the doctrine of salvation. And the Galatians were giving up this freedom that had so recently come in Christ after having been under the law for many centuries. So Paul's saying, stand fast in this liberty. And later in the chapter, he'll talk about walking that liberty. 
that is in Christ. In the other epistles of Paul, we, when Paul says to stand in grace by faith, that's in Romans 5, verse 2. We stand in God's power, uh, not mankind's wisdom. Sounds like wisdom to me. Second, or 1 Corinthians 2, verse 5. Uh, or we stand fast in the faith in 1 Corinthians 16. We stand against the wiles of the devil in that chapter, uh, Ephesians 6, the armor of God. And we were to stand in the evil day and we're to stand in truth and righteousness, all in Ephesians 6. That's a great chapter to, to read repeatedly. And now he says, stand fast in the liberty wherewith God has set us free here in Galatians 5.1. And the idea of standing fast means don't get entangled with all that other stuff. Don't let that tangle you up and pull you away like ropes do. Liberty is freedom, not entanglement. Spiders entangle. Think what a spider does. Takes away the freedom of the bug, right? He entangles them. And it takes away life also. And that's the idea is don't get entangled. Jesus has set us free. Walk in that freedom with God's strength. Don't get tangled up and get into bondage and of the law. The Jews saw the law as a good thing, something you could do, something you could perform to get into glory. Paul saw it, saw it as slavery, entanglement. After the Civil War, many black people didn't know they were free. And, and some were kept in slavery by dishonest men that didn't let them know that they were free. We are free in Christ as Christians, regardless of our color. But many are still in bondage to their old master, sin, the flesh, and the devil. Remember those? And they continue to tell us that we're not really saved. We're not really forgiven. We're not really innocent. I mean, look at when Jerry walked in this morning. He says, good morning, sinners. <laughs> I said, you know my name. <laughs> you know, who's our master? <laughs> sin, the death, and the devil? <laughs> no. Um, Paul had this way of bringing Gentiles under the law, or this to say, and let me just read out of Acts chapter 15, verse 10. Now, therefore, why do you tempt God to put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? We got this law. We can't keep it. But we believe that through the grace of God, Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. He's saying our own Fathers, our grandfathers, our, our own people couldn't justify themselves to God through the law. We shouldn't be expecting it of the Gentiles. We shouldn't be putting this burden on other people. It's a heavy yoke because it's impossible to do. Verse 2, he says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Saying, if you're a Jew trying to live by the law of Moses, counting on your good works to get you to heaven, Jesus Christ won't do you any good. He says, it'll profit you nothing. Salvation by the law, keeping all these rules, or Jesus are so contrary to one another, they're so different from one another, there's a choice that has to be made. If our deeds, if our good deeds are our righteousness, then we can't use Jesus as our righteousness. And if Jesus is our righteousness, we can't use the law as our righteousness. We have to embrace one or the other. We have to choose one another. We can't have both, and that's what the legalists and the Judaizers were trying to do in that day. If you're going to earn your salvation, you can't take God's gift of free salvation because it's a gift. And if you take God's gift, you can't earn it because it's free. It's really pretty clever and pretty simple. You can't do both. He's saying it's not an option. Grace and the law just aren't compatible with one another. They're, they're two different. They're opposites. And the debtor to do the whole law means no amount of obedience makes up for one act of disobedience. So it's all or nothing. Keep it all in thought, word, and deed, 24-7, 365 days a year, forever. You actually could earn your way to heaven if you could do that in thought, word, and deed, but we can't. We know that. That's what Paul's saying here. We, we know that, but you can't. Verse 5, uh, 
For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. So walking in the Spirit means we don't try to earn our righteousness we don't, and through our good deeds, and we know that. If you stopped every day on your way to work, let's say you have a, a place that you go to work. I, for 22 years, I went to Kodak Park, and I worked there. If every day, instead of going to work, you stopped off at the food kitchen, and you worked all day in the food kitchen feeding the needy, and never made it to work day after day after day, I know what my boss would have said. He would say, well, I recognize the good work you're doing, but there's no hope that I'm going to pay you because you're not here. And that requires that you be at work to do this. Same with Jesus. We have to come to him in faith. He might recognize the good work that we do, but there's no chance, there's no hope that he'll save us by that work because it requires faith that we believe in him and his atoning death on the cross. And when we walk in the Spirit, we know it doesn't matter if we're a Jew or a Gentile or whatever we may call ourselves. A Jew, a Gentile is actually anyone who isn't a Jew, so we're either one or the other. What matters? Faith and love. Something absent in the legalist. Paul said in Romans 14, 17, The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The Lord will put that in us. Verse 7. Or, uh, you did run well. In other words, you're doing pretty good here. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion comes not of him that calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would that there were even cut off which trouble you. He's saying, you Galatians, you, you got a good start. You ran really well for a while. And I ran track and field and cross country in high school. I know what it's like to run, to get out and run and run and run. And every racer, especially in the short sprints, you know that the start's really important. But finishing well is why we race. They don't hand out awards for the best start. You notice that? Boy, you were great getting out of those blocks. You get it. You were the last one coming in, but you did good when you started. No, that's not what they say. A racer can have a great start and then fall during the race. And I've had spills on the track. I see many on TV. You know, and maybe you've seen that great fall off the ski jump where the guy goes tumbling through the air. That's not finishing well. We can have a good start with Christ and fall from grace through sin, get entangled, as we talked about earlier, in the things of the world. Paul knows these false teachers are hindering the Galatians. Because any move away from God's truth didn't come from Jesus, him who calls you, he says, him who calls you. This getting to God through good works didn't come from Jesus, him who calls you. And the, the Galatians were leaving Jesus to follow other doctrines that were being taught to them, seeking another gospel, he said earlier. He says, which is not another gospel. And many leave Jesus even today to pursue after man's doctrines of success and wealth, popularity, comfort, great traps. But false doctrines spread like leaven, he says, like yeast in a lump of dough. I love the smell of fresh baked bread. And you know that it had to rise in order to get to there and then baked in the oven. The yeast that you put in it, you put a little bit in it and it multiplies. A little bit of yeast affects the whole lump of bread, of dough. And Paul's talking about this to the legalists. He says the legalists, a little bit of their words can affect the whole lump of Christianity, if you will. I'm not calling you lumpy, but, you know. Paul wishes these legalists would be cut off from other believers because of the damage they're doing. Verse 13, For brethren, you have been called to liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. We're called to freedom, we're called to liberty, but not the liberty of serving ourselves. But it's the liberty to serve others, love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves. Don't devour one another. And liberty can be used for selfish motives, we all know well, as an opportunity to serve self. But when we love our neighbor as ourself and serve one another through love, we fulfill the great commission, the great commandment in Matthew, the end of Matthew. But you know, Satan, when he sees a, a solid doctrine, he tries to twist something else in there. And we've one of the loving our neighbors been twisted a bit, saying, well, you need to love yourself first. Have you heard that one? In order to love somebody else, you have to love yourself first. I didn't need to. I love myself first. We all love ourselves first. The fact is, we naturally care for ourselves. When we wake up in the morning and groaning, we're groaning of our own pain, not somebody else's usually. But we need God's supernatural touch to love and to care for others. We don't need to love ourselves before we can leave up and love others. But it means we're to love our neighbor on the same level of interest we show for ourselves, the same love we have to love ourselves, the same love, love we have to serve ourselves. <laughs> I, I ran across a saying that says, you know, at age 20, we worry about what others think of us. At age 40, we don't care what they think of us. At age 60, we realize they haven't really been thinking of us at all. <laughs> you know, so it's natural for us to be self-absorbed. It's natural to love ourselves, but it's not natural to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's why God tells us to do it, because it's not natural. It's supernatural. It's a God thing. It's godly. And now the last verses for today. 16 to 18. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the flesh, lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. He's saying there's a battle going on between us believers. I remember the revelation when I first heard it's taught that the battle begins when the Spirit enters the body through faith in Christ. That's when the battle begins, because before that we're sold out to the world. Oh, we're, we want to be moral, but we don't want to be righteous. If the Spirit is in us, and we know this battle is alive between the flesh and the Spirit, why do we have a problem being godly all the time? He's saying, well... The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. The body and the spirit, are they're at war. There's a battle going on. It's contrary to one another. We want different things. The spirit wants to pray and worship God, listen to teachings, read the word of God. And the flesh wants to overindulge in all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Paul says, walk in the spirit. Don't try to live by the law. Be led by the spirit of God. Legalists would fear walking in the Spirit leading us, thinking that, well, nobody can handle that well. You can't give people that kind of freedom. It gives too much freedom to sin. and Only the law of Moses is, can keep us holy, because that tells us what to do and we have to keep us. But Paul's saying that's wrong. That's wrong. Walking in the Spirit, living life in the Spirit, is a life of faith and love. And the Holy Spirit restrains us if we yield. The old man, the old woman, was crucified with Christ. Spiritually, dead and gone. But the old man, the old woman's influence lives on through the flesh, it would seem, and battles us daily, as it says here. And it will, till God gives us a new body. I'm glad we're made in three parts, body, body soul, and spirit, because when the body goes into the ground, the soul and the spirit are free to go somewhere. God says if we believe in him, it goes to him. He'll give us that resurrected body. But till that day, if we're led by the Spirit, if we walk in the Spirit, we're not under that law. We don't have to submit to that law. And you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Paul, Paul understood in Romans 7. It's a great chapter to read. Paul understood this battle. He says, I'm carnal, sold under sin. Seems I don't even know what I'm doing. The things I should do, I don't do. The things I shouldn't do, those things I do. What is going on here, he says? That's why obedience to God's Spirit is so essential. Obedience. 
I want to read you a story uh, about the training of Arabian horses. I've used this before, but it's a really poignant story. Arabian horses go through a rigorous training in the deserts of the Middle East. The, The trainers require absolute obedience from the horses, and they test them to see if they are completely trained, completely obedient. The final test is almost beyond the endurance of any living thing. The trainer forces the horses to do without water for many days. It didn't say how many. Then he turns them loose, and of course they start running toward the water. But just as they get to the edge, ready to plunge in and drink, the trainer blows his whistle, which is the sign to stop. The horses who have been completely trained and have learned perfect obedience stop. They turn around and they come pacing back to the trainer. They stand there quivering, knowing the water's there, wanting the water that's there, but they wait in perfect obedience. When the trainer is sure that he has that obedience, he gives them a signal to go back and drink. Now this may be severe, but when you're on the trackless desert of Arabia and your life is entrusted to a horse, you would better have a trained, obedient horse pretty powerful. We live in a moral desert. There are temptations all around us. We must be willing to resist the temptations, like that horse resisting the temptation to go to the water because his his, uh, owner did not tell him he could. We stand in obedience to our master because it pleases him. We stop in obedience to our master because it pleases him. We move forward in obedience to our master because it pleases him. Psalm 31.3 says, For thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore for thy name's sake lead me and guide me. God's Holy Spirit guides us into his truth and obedience. And that's the key here. Let's stand and pray. Oh, Lord, such a battle with the flesh. The Spirit wants to be obedient, Lord, and do everything you say, but our flesh is rebellious and wants its own way. Help us, Lord, to yield to you, the one who always has our best interest in mind, Lord. Sometimes our self does not have our best interest in mind, Lord, but you do. So help us, Lord, to yield to you when those problems, when those troubles, those decisions come our way that we're unsure of. Lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit into the deep things that you want us to know. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.